With the unmistakable suspension fork up front, you'll probably spot this one from a mile away. Roughly translating to perseverance, the Seekler is the latest model from the Icelandic brand and it offers a whole lot to talk about. Designed for gravel racing, the Seekler offers geometry closely comparable to Lauf's True Grip bike, but it comes with a claimed increase in frame compliance and room for enormous mountain bike like 700 by 57 millimeter tires or 29 by 2.25 inch if you're talking mountain bike tires. Helping to achieve that is a lack of front derailleur compatibility, but as we'll get to later, there's far, far more to it than that. I probably don't need to point it out, but up front sits Lauf's third generation grit fork, an impressively lightweight suspension fork that achieves its springy nature through carbon fiber leaf springs. The Seekler is also available with a rigid fork that saves approximately 400 grams and a few hundred dollars. A medium painted Seekler frame is quoted to weigh 1,163 grams and the Weekend Warrior wireless build tested weighed 9.08 kilograms with inner tubes. This model is priced at $3,990 US. Now that price may have just surprised you and to be fair, you'll need to add about $100 for shipping and perhaps a little more for sales taxes. Still, the Consumer Direct company packs in the value with the SRAM Rival Axis Explore group set, a SRAM Rival power meter, and E13 wheels. Okay, it's time to ride this thing some more and dive a little deeper on this interesting gravel race machine. We have now arrived at one of, well, I would say the most interesting bike that we have covered at this year's field test, the Lauf Siegler Weekend Warrior Wireless. We got a lot to say about this one, Dave. I kind of want to start with you because I feel like you have the most thoughts on this bike. Yes, it, it's <laughs> unlike any other bike we have. Uh, obviously- Mostly in a good way. Mostly in a good way. Uh, obviously the, the suspension fork on the front is what most people's eyes will go to as the first thing. Uh, but really for me, what stood out is the tire clearance on this bike. And I think that is something that so much of the bike has been based around that tire clearance. And a lot of the quirks of it come as a result of that tire clearance. So that tire clearance is 700 by 57 millimeters. Which is massive considering this bike isn't like stretched out like a It's not stretched out, it's a 425 millimeter chainstay length, which is short, but in order to fit such a huge mountain bike sized tire in there, uh, they've basically had to remove the ability to have a front derailleur. They have had to have a custom crank made because they're using a mountain bike with bottom bracket on this. So currently SRAM have produced a crank for them and you can get crank sets to fit if it's a modular crank design, say like a Rotor or an Eastern or something like that. Road boost is coming. But, Shimano, probably nothing at the moment unless you can find like a pre-mountain bike, pre-boost crank from the mountain bike world to fit. So yeah, there's, there's a few wacky things and then the seat tube angle as well as a result of that tire clearance. It's, it's sitting at a strange, strange place, uh, but I guess the, they've done some really cool things as well. Like normally when you're talking massive tire clearance, there's a, a significantly dropped chain stay. This bike has straight stays uh, Lauf claim that it's just structurally better. It's a straight path. It's a simpler, it's a simpler tube. It creates a lighter weight frame. It's not even a tube though. Like, like that's... And it's not a tube. It's literally just six millimeters thick carbon fiber. On the drive side, like right behind yeah. the bottom bracket. Yeah. So it's like a blade. Yes. So they've, they've been just so creative and out of the box thinking with this frame. There's a lot of things on this bike that we haven't seen before. And then on the trail, it makes for a bike that is quite unique in many ways. Uh, I found it very capable. It's designed as a race bike. Let's, let's just clear that up. It is designed to race gravel. It's designed to be quick. It's designed to be reactive. I found it to be those things. But at the same time, I also found it to be very capable off-road. I found that I could push this bike almost like it was a mountain bike. Uh, and, and I found it did quite a good job in that sense. Um, Betsy, I would say that of the three of us standing here, you are probably the most qualified gravel racer here. Sure. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, what did you think of this? Because again, as Dave mentioned, this is 
Lop is very, very specific. It's a gravel race bike. Yeah. It, it felt like a gravel race bike, absolutely. And having gone to a lot of gravel races, I see Laufs out um, in the wild a lot. Uh, this is this is their new, this is new, right? This mm -hmm. model, yeah. So I haven't seen this particular bike, but I've always wanted to test a Lauf fork. And yeah, it's funny hearing you talk about like all the modifications and all the things that they had to do to make this bike accept such wide tires. And like, normally that would make me quite skeptical. Like, okay, well, you know, the other shoe's got to drop somewhere, but it, it, you hop on this bike and it really rides nicely. Yeah, it, I would definitely do a gravel race on this bike. However, I would also ride single track, which on, when I was testing this bike, I did get carried away and like, yeah. <laughs> went mountain biking basically. Yeah, I, I found it like really <laughs> maneuverable, the bike, like the, the front wheel was very easy to lift, yeah. uh, kind of like a mountain bike. And it was quite a fun bike to sort of weave through in between rocks or over the rocks or, or in the air. And I, I too got a bit carried away and you're like, oh, hang on, I'm actually on just a 40 millimeter tire. I should probably pull it back a bit. Uh, but yeah, I can certainly see putting like a, a 50 millimeter tire on this bike and just going crazy. Now what's, what's kind of cool is that they do pack in all that capability into something that is not weird in terms of the handling. Right. So it, it is designed to run with a fairly short stem. However, if you look at the numbers, it's really quite normal. Mm. Like, like you said, the back end short, the back end, or the back end is short, the front end is not crazy long, it's not crazy slack. So it does have all this capability, but it's also still meant to be and is pretty agile. Mm -hmm. And so it does seem like the reason why you can really push this thing so hard mm -hmm. is because uh, I think a large, I think a lot of that has to do with that fork. I mean, it's, yeah. it's relatively forgiving. And, but it, it's not, for as much capability as it has, it does still feel like it's happier going really fast on a gravel race course as opposed to doing that kind of lower speed pseudo underbiking stuff. Correct, yeah. And I think, again, like race bike, they haven't even put fender mounts, they haven't put rack mounts on this. They've just designed it almost like Cervelo designed the Aspero, but they've kind of done it with in their own way, their own unique way. But it's very much with that idea that you put a number plate on, you're going A to B as fast as possible. It's not to see the sights with. So along those lines, Dave, I know you in particular found this bike to be quite comfortable up front. And Betsy, I think you felt that most of the time yeah. too, right? Yeah. So I, having ridden a, at least a couple of different generations of this fork now, I, I feel like I'm a little bit of an outlier at this table, at least anyway, in terms of how I feel like mm -hmm. it felt, that fork. <laughs> Because for me, I mean, Dave, you and I are very similar in weight. Um, I think we're pretty similar in riding style overall. Yeah. And I personally didn't find it as comfortable as you did. I mean, it's, it's definitely more, it's definitely cushier than a fully rigid fork mm. for the most part. Yeah. But I think when you couple that with kind of like the relative stiffness of those carbon fiber leaf springs and the, the fact that the, the frame itself is also quite stiff, it felt to me like it's a fork that's tuned for hitting stuff fast at speed, as opposed to kind of like picking your way through something. Mm -hmm. Because one of the bikes that we, I feel like compared to a lot was that Salsa Journeyer, which is like a third of the cost or something. Um, and, and we'll talk about that specifically in a separate, separate uh, video. But for me, I actually found that bike overall to be a lot softer and more compliant. And interestingly enough, at both ends, and I think it's, a beca I think it's because that bike, that frame, that aluminum frame that the Journey is built around is just softer overall. And I actually found myself pushing that bike harder in trail situations than this bike. So I, you mentioned that to me, and then I went and did back-to-back -back testing just because I was kind of second guessing my thoughts of the Lauf based Which on you what you had said. <laughs> And what I found is I was much more comfortable at a higher speed on the Lauf. So I was going faster and I was more comfortable doing it. Uh, and I could see that like in the amount of arm movement I was getting. So the Lauf, I was smashing through like a rocky section of trail and it felt controlled. The front wheel was just kind of 
floating through. It wasn't skipping across. I just felt like I had that traction and I could see it in my arms. I wasn't vibrating all over the place. I just had control of that front end. Yes, the rear end was a little bit stiff. It was a bit, it was a little bit unbalanced at times. I felt that skipping around a bit. But for the, for the front end, I felt just confident being over the front of the handlebars and just holding on. By comparison, the salsa, I was actually having to get onto the brakes a bit more and I sort of felt like my biceps were flapping around like I was trying to do the chicken dance. So in that sense- I kinda wanna see Dave do the chicken dance now. Yeah, so <laughs> no one needs to see that. But I, yeah, for me, I think the, the fork on the front does make an appreciable difference. I think if all I wanted to do was very smooth gravel, I'd probably select the model that has the rigid fork on it, which saves about 400 grams and a few hundred dollars. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, I, I, I really like that fork, especially for when things get a bit more chundery and a bit rougher and you're really plowing into it. I think you're gonna save yourself a few front rims, uh, but more importantly, I just wasn't getting as fatigued through the hands. One thing that you kind of touched on is just like that balance. Um, so coming back to that salsa, that you know, whether, whether or not we agree on whether, on, on which bike was softer up front, I think we both agree that that salsa was more balanced front to rear. It was just... So. Yeah, I think, I think in terms of smoothness, I still think the Lauf might have had the edge, but the salsa wins over in the wheelbase length where that wheelbase, I think, stopped the bike from skipping around for me. Sure. Yeah. Um, I would really love, I and mean, we, we unfortunately didn't have one here, I would love to see how this Lauf would ride with something like that Ergon slash Canyon leaf spring seat post um, because that uses a very similar concept, obviously. And I wonder if that would make for a more balanced feel yeah. because as much as you, like, like you said, as much as you have kind of like the squishiness up front, that kind of imbalance for me at least kind of threw things off a little bit. Um, but again, in a gravel race situation, I think it's probably okay. It was a design element that, that Lauf have decided to do. They've gone with quite a slack seat tube angle and the theory is is that you create like a, a cantilever of the seat tube which then puts more weight and lets you bend that seat post more didn't really work with an a, quite a thickly gauged aluminium seat post it's it's still quite stiff mm -hmm. um and i worry that that design would actually put more load onto like a carbon seat post than the, the carbon seat post may have initially been designed to handle so it's something I'd want to change on the bike, but it's also something I'd be a little bit weary and I'd, I'd want to make sure that the seat post is up to that. Sure, that I, I think in most cases it would probably be okay. Yeah. But I guess along those lines, I guess I sort of wish a little bit that if Lauf really were trying to get a little bit more compliance from the seat post in the back, I kind of wish that it was a little bit more of a sloping top tube to expose more seat post. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think it's worth noting too that I actually requested this bike with a rigid fork uh, and Lauf kind of messed up a little bit because they, they originally they were supposed to send, they had a complete bike with the suspension fork and they were supposed to ship a rigid fork separately. But what they actually shipped was this bike with the suspension fork and then another suspension <laughs> fork separately. So we had a laugh about that. <laughs> oh, oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, my point being, it's a, you, you kind of touch, touch upon this again, but the, the upcharge for this fork is very modest. It's like, yeah. Three hundred and fifty dollars or something like that. that yeah. Yeah. How much is this bike? It is right around four thousand US, which, all things considered, wow, is I've, pretty good. I thought you yes. were going to say more than that. No. So, um, component-wise, I again, like Lauf is a really tiny company, yeah. and I think we were all pretty surprised at what they were able to provide for this kind of money. Right. The value is packed in this bike, like. They, like we double checked the numbers several times. because like, It, it is a right. consumer direct company, that's worth keeping in mind. But even still, like they've done some things, they've, they've given you some things that you just would not expect. Like you look at the frame, you're like, that frame is wild. It's got some really unique things like that carbon plate for the chainstay and the fork. Mm -hmm. That would be enough for most brands. And they'd be like, let's charge a lot for this. Right. But Lauf have then decided to like put very good components on this bike. Uh, the drivetrain, for example, the Explore uh, Rival, Axis Rival, that's, a, that's not a cheap group set. You don't normally find that at this price point, let alone on a frame that yeah. has these features. And I think, oh, you run, I know you run, you run GRX DIT on your personal gravel bike, I think, right? XT. Oh, X, still buttons though, beep, beep boop. Buttons. Um, and I know you're a pretty big fan of having access on this bike, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, I. It shifted flawlessly, and um, I will say too, like 
it's it's marketed as a race bike, but I think it's a great adventure bike. Like I think this would be really fun to take on sort of what I what what my like backyard rides are, which are a combination of really rough stuff, pavement, and tons of climbing. But yeah, so Rival Axis Explore, um, they also included the power meter. It's crazy, right? Yeah. The power meter is normally included as a feature to distract from the like the lack of features on the frame. Right. You know, it's like, oh, it's got a power meter. You know, this, there's value in this bike. They didn't need to include that. It would, you'd still look at it and be like, this is a fantastic value bike. Yep. And for me, it's kind of funny because you almost overlook the fact that it has a power meter because everything else is like distracting you. So well done on, to them for doing that. I don't know if they needed to, but I'm not complaining. Right. And then the, the E13 wheels that they use, it's, they easily could have gone with a house brand or just kind of whatever. Yeah. Um, but they went with a name brand wheel set, came with valve stems, rims were pre-taped for, for uh, running tubeless. Super easy conversion. Yeah. Um, good tires, Maxxis Ramblers. Um, it was a less expensive stem and seat post, but they include their own carbon bars. Like they, it's supposed to ride smoother. They call yeah. it the smoothie, I think. Yeah. Um, and I got like, on with the shape of it. Like they really didn't skimp anywhere. No. 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 So yeah, it's overall like they've done a really good job. It's just, it's still a little bit quirky. Mm -hmm. the, right. So yeah. what about the quirks? Like there, I know that there were things about this bike that we didn't maybe necessarily love. Mm. The one that's top of mind for me is just uh, related to the, the seat tube. So one, I had seat post slipping issues. I ended up stuffing the seat post full of carbon grit and then over the seat post clamp. That Which you could get it. away with because it was a cheaper aluminum post. Correct. Uh, and then that seat close clamp as well, we were kind of having to hold it down while we're tightening it. It's quite loose, but it's a standard diameter seat post and it's a standard diameter seat post clamp. So you can always change those. So it's kind of, I'll, I'll give them a pass on that. But the seat tube angle, so it's, it's, it's steeper, sorry, it's slacker than 73 degrees. So I kind of, in my mind, 73 degrees is sort of the slackest I'd consider right. going but, on a bike. But I guess it's not like crazy slack. It's, it's like, not crazy it's like slack. 72 actual or I something like that. I didn't feel it's that. Nuts. Yeah, yeah. So for me, I was at the, with my saddle height, I was kind of at the, the limit, the maximum uh, insertion point of the right. saddle. And then at that point it gets, it gets slacker and slacker the, t the, the higher you put the seat post up. For me, I was like, I was basically running out of saddle rail to get the, right. as over the bottom bracket as I wanted to be. Right. Not a deal breaker, I made it work, uh, but it is something to keep in mind. Right, and what, I guess something to note there too is, you know, you and I are almost ident identical in total height, mm -hmm. but we're quite different in terms of saddle position. Like you, you run your saddle quite a bit higher and further back and I'm lower and further forward because I sh have shorter legs and shorter femurs. Um, that's maybe something to keep in mind, yeah, if someone is kind of more proportioned like you. Yeah. Um, Betsy, any kind of quirks or drawbacks from you on this one? Not really. I mean, I would, like I said, I'm, since I'm not totally sold on suspension on gravel bikes, I'd love to try it without that fork, with the rigid fork. Um, but this was one of those bikes I hopped on and was like, I could ride a long way on this bike. And I, and I think once or twice you may have. <laughs> yeah, you should do. Okay, so who is this bike for? A weekend warrior, of course. Oh, man. <laughs> no. It's rubbing off on you. <laughs> it's definitely for someone who wants to race gravel. But it's also, I think too, like, it's for someone who also loves to put together routes on various surfaces. It's, it's a fun bike. Right, because you can do a fair bit of exploring and you can get away with it on this bike. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Dave? Yeah, uh, I think it's for the person that wants to do the occasional race and, and wants to push a, a gravel bike, do that underbiking thing where they're probably, where a mountain bike is probably often best. Uh, more importantly, I think it's for the person, if they're serious about their racing, it's the, right, I, it's the sort of race bike I'd pick if I knew the course would be rough and, and quite, quite technical that's the sort of bike that I think I'd be fastest on. Which, as it turns out, is pretty much what Lauf designed it to be. Great. Hmm. All right. That's our conclusion on the Lauf Siegler Weekend Warrior Wireless. If you've got any questions or comments, go ahead and leave them in the section below and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Make sure you check out the written review on cyclingtips.com. Uh, also, if you haven't already subscribed to our YouTube channel, go ahead and click like and subscribe and wherever those buttons are down there so you don't miss any upcoming content. 
Thanks again to ASOS for sponsoring this year's field test, and we'll see you again pretty soon. Thanks for watching. Well, I wish I wish for a more comfortable gravel bike. Oh, wow.